St. Petersburg is so far away. Six hours by car. Why haven't they made like a high-speed train, maybe using magnetic levitation, so it would take an hour to get there? Why do you think it's so difficult to build those kinds of trains? Let's figure it out. I think you probably know what a magnet is. It's extremely difficult to imagine modern life without one. Even a common refrigerator wouldn't close right without magnetic tape. However, this wasn't always the case. Magnets appeared in people's everyday lives only about a hundred years ago, and before that, people couldn't even imagine that there would exist such materials that could just stick to each other without any kind of glue or extra means or help. The first time mankind encountered something similar to a magnet was working with iron ore. Magnetite, as this rock, has the strongest magnetic properties of all minerals. Based on one theory, if lightning strikes magnetite ore deposits, because of the powerful magnetic field surrounding that arc discharge, a part of magnetite might turn into a weak natural magnet and even begin to attract some iron objects or other pieces of magnetite. Using such a natural magnet, it's possible to turn a piece of ordinary iron into a very weak magnet and even make primitive compass. And to do that, I took an ordinary needle and slightly magnetized it with a piece of magnetite, put it on a foam piece of plastic, and put it on the water surface. And as you can see, it's showing me magnetic north about the same as any compass on any smartphone would. And on one theory, such compasses were used by ancient Vikings during their voyages to England and other countries. And for the first attempts to create an artificial magnet, people used an ordinary horseshoe. Back in the middle of the 18th century, Swiss mechanic Johann Dietrich ran a current from a primitive galvanic cell through an insulated copper wire around the above-mentioned piece of metal. Imagine his surprise when the ordinary horseshoe retained its magnetic properties and became a permanent magnet, which was even stronger than all natural magnets they'd found. These magnets served as powerful, useful tools for scientists, and their shape prevented them from rapidly demagnetizing, which is common for iron objects of other shapes. The reason is that the magnetic poles are located close to each other, and when attracting other objects, the magnetic field doesn't disperse through the air, but closes a loop, just like a magnetic keeper. And even more than 250 years later, lots of magnets are still made the same exact horseshoe shape. Therefore, the first metals used to make a magnet were iron with copper winding, and it's not for nothing because iron appears to be the most magnetic of all metals. I wonder if iron and copper can be used to build a real levitating transport today. To figure it out, I'll travel to the currently the most advanced country with magnets. That is Japan. It turns out an entire subway line based on electromagnetic suspension using both iron and copper was built for the 2005 World Exposition in the city of Nagoya, that's in central Japan. The local trains use magnetic levitation instead of wheels. It makes them virtually silent and even allows them to accelerate with absolute ease. So far, it's pretty quiet. A little bit of acceleration, it feels just like it's floating. It's moving faster now, feeling much better, super quiet. I like it. It's an interesting type of magnetic levitation transporting device. Unfortunately, because of the frequent stops, it doesn't go faster than 55 miles an hour, but I still enjoyed this very unique ride. But still, trains with electromagnetic suspension consume a lot of energy. As you see for yourself, they can't accelerate to really high speeds. For more rapid transportation, we probably need more powerful magnets and some other tech. This is where the well-known neodymium magnets, developed in Japan together with the American General Electric Company, come to our aid. These magnets were created in the 70s of the 20th century. Scientists mixed ore with the rare earth metal neodymium and also with boron. After sintering this mixture in an inert atmosphere, they obtained an unusual ceramic with extremely strong magnetocapacitance. In other words, these magnets are several times more powerful than other known magnets. 
And yeah, the pieces you see on this screen are fragments of neodymium magnet, which was hit by another stronger magnet. As under the nickel shell, the magnetic material itself is very fragile and easily breaks down any hard object, like a ceramic, for example. By the way, I decided to launch a new project about chemical research and applied chemistry together with you, my viewers. So if you have any interesting research on chemistry or chemical production and you want me to show the world your projects, please contact me via the link in the description. I will be happy to come to you and make a video about it. Several interconnected neodymium magnets can provide real magnetic levitation if you put a piece of pyrolytic graphite on top of them. Pyrolytic graphite is the strongest diamagnetic material at room temperature. In other words, it repels any magnetic field. The only pity is it doesn't repel strong enough, so the disk levitates not too high and moreover, it can hold only a small weight, like a piece of styrofoam. That's not going to do it for a big train transport. More interesting levitation with neodymium magnets is possible if you use a thicker piece of pyrolytic graphite and a tiny magnet, above which you also need to fix a more or less strong magnet. By setting up the right configuration of all the parts, the small neodymium magnet will be able to levitate above the pyrolytic graphite, while being slightly attracted to the upper magnet. That looks fascinating, but just like in the previous case, this levitation is not stable and sustainable enough so it'll hardly help mankind create a super-fast transport system. Therefore, I decided to turn to a fairly recent invention, the so-called superconductor, which can be used to create the world's most powerful magnets and real levitation engines. To do this, I bought these black pieces called high-temperature ceramic superconductors. When cooled to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, they lose absolutely all electrical resistance, allowing a powerful neodymium magnet to levitate over their surface and hold a significant load. But how does it work? Well, first of all, I need to show you how ordinary conductors react to a temperature decrease. Let's do that now. To do this, I'll take a disk of regular copper and then carefully drop a powerful neodymium magnet onto its surface. As you can see, it easily falls on the surface of copper, but at the same time it slows down a bit, which isn't noticeable yet. In order to demonstrate this effect better, I cooled the disk in liquid nitrogen to minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. If we take the same magnet and drop it into the already cooled copper disk, we notice that the fall of the magnet starts to slow down a bit sort of a magnetic buffer. In fact, after cooling in liquid nitrogen, the electrical resistance of copper falls so significantly that an approaching magnet begins to create its own magnetic field in copper, resulting in the formation of eddy currents, which quickly weaken because of the presence of some electrical resistances, even in the cooled copper. It's interesting stuff. If we take a special ceramic with the abbreviation YBCO instead of copper and cool it down in liquid nitrogen, then its electrical resistance will be equal to zero. And when approaching it with a magnet, the created currents will be nearly infinite, and the superconductor itself will turn into a magnet, the strength of which will be almost equal to that of the magnet brought to it. In other words, the superconductor will become an ideal diamagnetic. If you press the magnet to the superconductor by force or cool the superconductor near the strong magnet, the magnetic fields of neodymium magnet will be sort of frozen in the superconductor, at the same time repelling the magnet itself from this piece of superconducting ceramic. Moreover, after removing this magnet, the piece of superconducting ceramic retains its magnetic properties, since the generated currents never cease, and can remain in this state as long as it's cooled with liquid nitrogen. Obviously, that's oversimplified, so let's get into how they actually do this. These superconductors consist of a mixture of yttrium, barium, and copper oxide, synthesized in a very special way. To produce them, they take an oxide of rare earth metal, yttrium, a little copper, and also barium nitrate, a substance that's used in pyrotechnics. To synthesize the superconductor, first, the yttrium oxide should be dissolved in nitric acid, but usually that doesn't happen very well, so I add some pieces of pure copper to the beaker. The copper immediately dissolves the nitric acid, forming copper nitrate and heating the mixture, thus helping the yttrium oxide dissolve better in the acidic environment of the solution, forming yttrium nitrate. After dissolving the copper and most of the yttrium oxide, 
I start to heat the mixture on a magnetic stirrer and add barium nitrate into the solution. After which, I add a little water to help all the components dissolve better. For further synthesis, I add citric acid to the mixture, after which the color turns a dark blue because of the copper complexes. Now all that's left is to evaporate the rest of the water out of the solution and wait for the nitrates to react with the citric acid, triggering the so-called pyrosynthesis, in the process of which a mixture of nitrates of different metals will form a mixture of yttrium, barium, and copper oxides, which is known by the abbreviation YBCO. This process is unusual but spectacular. After all this, the resulting mixture hardly resembles ceramics. In order to produce a superconductor, the resulting oxide mixture has to be crushed, compressed, and baked in a muffle furnace with the addition of pure oxygen. Moreover, the baking has to be conducted at a decreasing temperature, so the required crystals of a certain size and chemical composition could form in the ceramics, thus providing it with the above-mentioned unusual superconducting properties. After synthesis, the obtained ceramics can lose absolutely all electrical resistance when cooled to a temperature of minus 292 Fahrenheit. It's quite easy to achieve by immersing it in liquid nitrogen. It also is interesting to note that no external energy is required for this levitation, only initial magnetic impulse from a permanent magnet. These ceramics can be shaped not only as bars, but also as real superconducting wires. In order to produce them, a layer of the very mixture of yttrium, barium, and copper oxides is sprayed between the two copper sheets with the help of plasma, and then baked in a special way to form this superconducting wire. When it comes to cooling liquid nitrogen, it also loses all of its electrical resistance. And I tried to measure it with a multimeter, but for some reason it showed almost the same values before and after the cooling, probably because the tape itself is covered with copper and the multimeter probes never touched the superconductor itself. Anyway, after cooling the superconductor tape was trying to jump out of the foam box when I brought a powerful neodymium magnet close to it which proved its ability to become an ideal diamagnetic, in other words, acquiring magnetic field of the same strength and opposite polarity as the permanent magnet brought to it. This has been an interesting experiment. The only way I managed to subdue this superconducting tape was to coil it up in liquid nitrogen, thereby creating endless currents and magnetic fields in the tape that could keep the magnet from falling into the nitrogen. Thus, a so-called quantum locking occurred between the magnet and the tape. Quantum locking is a state in which the magnetic field of the superconductor counterbalances the magnet's gravitational attraction to the Earth. It looks quite unusual because even such a thin superconductor tape is able to create a very powerful current within itself, generating its own magnetic field that makes this large and heavy magnet levitate. Obviously, until the tape heats up and loses all of its superconducting properties. But because of the high cost of high temperature superconductors, their application is extremely limited nowadays. They're used only in the most complex and expensive projects. For example, for scientific research or mining of minerals. For instance, a piece of high temperature superconducting ceramics costs about $200. A meter of high temperature superconducting wire costs about $120 all by itself. Therefore, instead of newfangled and expensive high-temperature superconductors, old-fashioned low-temperature superconductors, which are several times cheaper, are used these days. But because of an earlier discovery, they lose absolutely all electrical resistance only at the temperature of liquid helium. To demonstrate this, I bought this scrap of superconducting wire billet consisting of copper and soldered bars of a rare metal alloy of niobium and titanium. Such a superconductor is called a low temperature one because cooling to the temperature of liquid nitrogen is not enough for it to lose absolutely all electrical resistance. We need liquid helium with a boiling point of minus 425 degrees Fahrenheit, which I'm not going to lie to you, is extremely difficult to acquire these days. To start, we filled a vacuum flask with some liquid helium and tried to cool the already cold piece of superconductor with it. But because of its low heat capacity, the helium evaporated instantly and immediately disappeared, barely lowering the temperature of the superconductor. For more efficient cooling, we poured liquid helium into a transparent Dewar flask. 
After that, I immersed the superconductor into it using this improvised holder. Eventually, the helium stopped boiling, and the superconductor cooled to a temperature of only 5 degrees above absolute zero. After that, I decided to check if it had lost all of its electrical resistance. Yeah, levitation over the magnet didn't work out so well this time. Apparently, with no insulation, the superconductor heated up quickly in hot weather, from which it instantly began to lose all its extraordinary properties. Because of that, nowadays low temperature superconductors are used mainly in the form of wires. That is, such billets are stretched into very thin threads and coiled on various electromagnets, which are used for example in MRI to create the most powerful magnets on Earth, as well as for testing fastest means of ground transportation, like magnetic levitation trains. In order to learn more about these trains, I traveled to Yamanashi, a city not far from the capital of Japan, Tokyo. This city, or rather the village between picturesque hills, has a research center where Japanese scientists have been testing a future magnetic levitation train since the 60s of the 20th century. This train will travel at the speed of 310 miles an hour, connecting Tokyo and Nagoya with the fastest land transport line. In the main hall of this center, you can see an interesting simplified model of the future high-speed line, made of numerous interconnected neodymium magnets. For the demonstration, they use a high-temperature superconductor covered with some kind of insulation and cooled in liquid nitrogen. As soon as it's pressed against the magnets, a very strong quantum lock between the magnets and the superconductor allows the latter to levitate along this magnetic rail very quickly and without any resistance, as well as without additional energy, until it's heated above a critical temperature. This principle of dynamic levitation is used in the new Japanese maglev trains. While I was filming the demonstration on the test stand, the new maglev train itself arrived at the tracks to make a few test runs. As you can see, there are some devices on the sides of the track that are crucial for the movement of the train. They consist of ordinary electromagnets as well as eight-shaped coils made of thick copper wire. You'll soon find out more about them. Inside the train, there are coils of low-temperature wires cooled with liquid helium, which create the most efficient and powerful electromagnets. To create a magnetic field, they are supplied with a current of several hundred thousand amperes, which doesn't run out because superconducting wires have no resistance. After accelerating on regular wheels, such a magnetic levitation train starts levitating with the help of copper eight-shaped coils embedded on the sides of the rails. Thus, this transport can accelerate to an incredible 310 miles an hour and maintain this speed for a long time without consuming much electricity. Let's just listen to the sound of it. Sometimes it might be a little scary if you get too close. Another interesting fact is that the faster the train moves, the more currents it generates, which makes the levitation much more stable. Therefore, any accidents on the curves are virtually impossible. In addition, the energy is spent only on variable magnets in the rails, which are used to accelerate the train. So this type of transportation is also quite economical, since after the acceleration, it can levitate practically without wasting energy, as the friction force between the train and the rails is minimal. A new high-speed railway from Tokyo to Nagoya is planned to be built in 2027, after which the world will witness the first commercial maglev train created with the help of copper and niobium titanium alloy-based superconductors. Well, I think after watching this video, you learn more about the functioning of those super fast magnetic levitation trains and what metals made such a miracle of engineering even possible. If you enjoyed this video, as always, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel to see many more new and interesting things.